thank you again for attending the 2018 Annual Public Forum for MedDevice Innovation Consortium. My name is Randy Schustel. I work at Boston Scientific. I'm a board member at MDIC, and I've been on board from day one. So it's been a pleasure to see uh, the recognition of the five-year accomplishments uh, with FDA and CMS, a strong partnership throughout. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, this session now, we will talk uh, about a new topic for uh, the industry and new for MDIC with some project activity that we've moved forward with. Uh, we'll talk about cybersecurity, and we will really think uh, more focus more on coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So with that, I'll spend just a couple of minutes up front. I will turn the presentation over to representatives from Debevoy and Plimpton. Uh, their team conducted a study for us, funded by MDIC, and we'll get an overview of that study. And then we'll change out our panel and have some panel-related questions on coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And then the third section will be to open up for Q&A from our audience. There's my mugshot. <laughs> our, why are we here? Uh, cybersecurity, obviously, an important topic today in med device, uh, one that we're all very highly engaged in and uh, learning quickly as we move forward. Uh, we'll do the project presentation, the panel discussion, and Q&A. <laughs> obviously, we've got uh, recognition that cybersecurity is a, a national infrastructure uh, topic one that requires all of our attention and one that is truly global in nature. Uh, what we're looking for are the actions that we want to take as a community, uh, working closely with CDRH, uh, with Department of Homeland Security, with Advamed, with individual medical device companies, uh, with all the key stakeholders in the ecosystem to address cybersecurity and to make sure that our products are safe for use by physicians and fi safe for uh, continued health care by our patients. Um, a big question for us as we move throughout the session here is the bottom point here on the slide. Now, what is the right role for MDIC? So as you think about uh, questions for the third segment of this session, uh, think about where do you think MDIC can provide the most value within this ecosystem working with FDA, uh, AdvMed, Homeland Security, and other stakeholders. Uh, we're certainly looking to promote medical device security for large, medium, and small companies, and to have that uh, mentality, that mindset, uh, built into product development for all contributors to med device. So with that, we'll move toward uh, the first session here uh, to talk about the project on cybersecurity uh, vulnerability disclosure. Great, thank you, Randy. It's really the, a pleasure to be here today on behalf of my law firm, Debevoise and Plimpton. We were truly honored that MDIC chose us to work on this project after the RFP, and we teamed on this project with our colleagues from Alvarez and Marsal, a leading cybersecurity advisory firm who we work with quite frequently on, on client projects due to their technical and technological prowess. So from Debevoise, we crafted a multidisciplinary team to work on this project due to the multidisciplinary nature of cybersecurity. I chair the firm's FDA regulatory practice. Luke Dambosky co-chairs our cybersecurity practice along with our partner, Jeremy Fagelson, who's in attendance today. Um, let me give you a bit of Luke's background. Luke was Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, responsible for national security at the Justice Department, responsible for handling all forms of cyber cases at the federal government. This included handling many of the uh, major cyber cases in recent years, including Target, Sony, Anthem, as well as many others. And for a while, Luke was also a, a diplomat in Russia which can lead to some interesting stories. Um, in addition, um, Luke and Jeremy co-chaired the ISAO Governance Working Group, which was um, 
created by the White House to encourage information sharing among a diverse array of uh, industries. I should also mention John DeCrane. John is one of the leading experts in the cybersecurity field. He has uh, technical and technical, technological prowess that he brings to bear when assessing cybersecurity issues, identifying issues, and more importantly, d discovering how to remediate them and hopefully fix the problem for our clients and many others. So let me tell you a little bit about the report. Um, in order to prepare this report, we interviewed many medical device companies, security researchers, trade associations, um, as well as FDA. And everyone was very forthcoming. And in turn, we've produced a comprehensive report addressing coordinated vulnerability disclosure for the medical device industry and the use of portals for receiving information and subsequently assessing and handling vulnerability information and disclosing when necessary. The report will contain extensive best practices that we learned from the interviews we conducted. We also assess legal as well as non-legal issues that are implicated when it comes to receiving cybersecurity vulnerability information um, and implementing a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. And in general, we hope it's a resource for the medical device industry and all stakeholders in the medical device ecosystem. We expect it to be released very soon, um, possibly as early as next week, if not shortly thereafter. Um, due to time constraints today, we can't go through it in a granular fashion, but we do plan on working with MDIC to put together a webinar where we can spend more time going through some of the granular details of the report, and we really look forward to that. Um, so with that, let me turn it to John, who can uh, provide some of the uh, definitional background and set the stage for this discussion. I, I should just last mention what, what the goal was. I mean, the, the goal of this report is to advance the adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosures by the medical device industry, but also to assess the impact on the entire ecosystem, not just the medical device manufacturers. So with that, John, let me turn it to you. Thank you, Paul. I think the first thing we should do is sort of define what a coordinated vulnerability disclosure is, and it's much more of a life cycle. If you think of a beginning to end of any life cycle, the disclosure is sort of the end result of that life cycle, and the coordination is the beginning and the process of that. We are looking at coordinated vulnerability disclosure as the formalized process of obtaining the evidence in which to determine do we have a vulnerability, how are we going to tackle the vulnerability, how we might mitigate it, and then how we might disclose or communicate that vulnerability to the public or to regulators, FDA, or CERT. Uh, online portals are one way of communicating not only the vulnerability to the public and those stakeholders who may be concerned, but receiving information from the public or from researchers, as we've learned recently uh, in the past several weeks, is a very valid part of learning how we have vulnerabilities on our devices through the public researchers. Great. I, I, I turned it off. Um, so l let me handle the next um, slide, which is really one of the key points we, we, we want to make, is really the importance of implementing and developing coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs for the medical device industry. And w w why is that? Um, the primary issue we all keep in mind is patient safety. And that's one of the things that really differentiates medical device companies from many other tech companies who don't have to deal with a regulator like FDA and don't have to worry about the safety of, 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 of patients in the real world. Um, so, so that's always the number one goal. And then the question becomes, how do you achieve that goal? And I think what we all realize is that uh, companies will become aware of vulnerabilities over time. And we're going to talk about different ways you can obtain that information. But because you will become aware of those vulnerabilities, it, it makes absolute sense to have a process already in place for handling the information. And w where you don't want to be is having to make very complex ad hoc decisions under duress. And, and that's why w w we think it's, it's critically important 
for companies to, to develop CBD programs in advance, um, establish SOPs governing those programs, and then implement them. And one of the, one of the key reasons among many others, is that you'll find that internally within a company, your internal stakeholders have uh, a diverse uh, array of opinions and views. You're going to bring in experts not only dealing with um, cybersecurity and vulnerabilities, but quality, legal, engineering. You could come up with you know, 12 to 15 different internal stakeholders and if you don't have a process in place in advance to address these issues, it can become a morass very quickly. So by having a policy, you improve internal communication, critical point. In addition, what we're finding is that medical device customers, the healthcare uh, uh, entities, the hospitals, they're very often demanding that companies have procedures in place and contractual issues arise. So that's another reason why it's, it's, it's really important to have these programs. And, and, and the last point we, we want to make on this slide is that as companies adopt CVD programs and as reporting publicly of vulnerabilities becomes more commonplace, there'll be less of any negative stigma or, or reaction to those reports. Hopefully at some point they'll become there are obviously differences, but it'll come analogous to routine software updates. It'll just be something that um, are, are reported and they're not necessarily viewed negatively and there's really little to no stigma associated with a vulnerability report. And I think that's the ultimate end game that we're all seeking. Luke? Thanks, Paul. I want to talk a little bit about the legal issues involved because these can be paralyzing if you just sort of squint and look at them from a distance. So it really does take rolling up your sleeves a little bit on this. First on the bad guy side, where I've spent most of my career pursuing hackers around the world for the Justice Department the last couple of years helping companies uh, defend against them. Um, they've evolved and they're much more sophisticated and diverse both in who they are and their goals. So we see, uh, for example, a rise in destructive attacks which ransomware I count as a destructive attack because of the effect on the victim. We see a rise in nation state activity to steal personal data of U.S. citizens, to steal intellectual property and your hard work and innovation. What uh, this has resulted in is a couple of things over the, year, over the 14 years that I've been involved in uh, this, really 16 years is uh, there's a lot more sophistication on the bad guy side. They really only need to be right once, where you need to be right pretty much every time, or you need to plan for a bad day very carefully, more likely. We've also seen regulators respond in a big way. Even five years ago, very few of them had done much in this space. They really didn't understand the issues like most of the population. They were all learning about it. Now they are highly motivated. You see. I think on our next slide, if we can go to the next one, you see a long list of uh, just a, well, just a few examples of some of the parties that play in the medical device space. Um, you're very blessed, I will say, having met your FDA reps that work on these issues. You're blessed to have people that will listen to you and take in seriously into account what you have to say and work with you um, in folks like Seth uh, Carmody and Suzanne Schwartz. Um, that is not always the case. I work across sectors and it's not always that way. But enforcement actions are up. Legal liability risk is up significantly. A little flavor window into my world and my team's world is that the cases that used to be brought were relatively few. They tended to be thrown out on a motion to dismiss. They didn't make it into discovery because of lack of ability of the uh, plaintiff to show harm. This is all changing. The trend line is the courts are allowing these cases to proceed. The plaintiff's bar is much more sophisticated. They know where to go and how to hit the soft spots in their way of crafting the case. What this means for you all is that uh, with discovery, there's a spotlight cast on how you, did you know about this vulnerability? What did you do about it? Did you have policies and procedures? And equally importantly, or even more, did you follow them? 
Um, so all of these things are being played out in courtrooms and in regulatory enforcement proceedings across sectors, and the medical device community is certainly uh, a key critical sector where these issues come up. You'll see from our report, uh, and I don't have time to go further into it, that we strongly believe, as do the, your colleagues that we interviewed, that the risks legally far outweigh uh, I'm sorry, the benefits far outweigh the risks. Um, to be ahead of these things, to cast a broad net, to spot the issues early and be proactive, yes, there's discomfort in disclosing things early. There's discomfort in interacting perhaps with security researchers in that community. There, you know, some may be trustworthy, some may be not. Um, so there's a lot of fear and concern there. But if it's done right, and that's another big part of the paper that we'll get into, if it's done right, the rewards and benefits in terms of risk reduction far outweigh uh, the risks. That's right. And when you think about the risk conceptually, as, as we point out, it's if you don't have adequate processes for receiving information, and therefore you don't become aware when you should have become aware, or if you become aware or, or, or didn't become aware and you don't do anything about it. So really the legal risk can arise in multiple contexts that you have to keep in mind. And then as, as Luke mentioned, um, th there are many types of liability that companies can confront in, in this area, which, which we address in detail in our report. But you see this FDA enforcement, which you know there, there have been an FDA shown a willingness to issue warning letters when appropriate in the cyberspace product liability lawsuits, SEC enforcement for publicly traded companies, HIPAA implications, FTC, state AG enforcement is, is, is certainly ongoing, class actions, and potentially prosecution. I don't know, Luke, if you want to add to any of that. Yeah, prosecution is um, much less likely, criminal prosecution certainly, than the civil, civil actions, both private civil party suits and enforcement actions of a civil nature. But it's possible. We see it also on the SEC front, as Paul mentioned, securities guidance now. The SEC uh, issued new guidance earlier this year that really puts a laser focus on these issues. Um, what are you disclosing versus what do you really know? Um, do those things align? Are people trading based on material non-public information? You know, all of these issues are important for companies in the public sector in this space. Uh, yeah, we do think it's uh, it's crucial. I'm mindful of our time. Please give us a wave, Randy. I want yep. you to two more minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Well, I'm going to take about 30 seconds of that and then turn it over to John on the last point on uh, how to structure the, a portal as one CVD option. Um, it's crucial that you have high-level buy-in for this effort. Everything from the mindset that we're going to share and not be lone ranger defenders on these issues, something other sectors as well as the medical community have learned long ago that no one company can stand up against all of the threats and software vulnerabilities and issues out there. It takes a team approach. But to have formalized uh, procedures as required and expected by uh, FDA to have a healthy reporting channel to the C-suite on these issues. FDA and other regulators are expecting you to have that. It's cross-functional, these issues, as Paul said, so that communications, legal, IT, infosec need to be really seamless across these areas. We'll try to outline a lot of this in terms of potential practices to consider in our report. John, I was wondering if you could say a last word on how to do a portal as one possibility for CVD disclosure. The first thing I would say is that the portal should be easy to use. I think through now, we're seeing that security researchers really had the bully pulpit in talking to device manufacturers, talking to the regulators about the vulnerabilities they were finding. But as devices become uh, more retail, and individuals are able to interact or at least communicate with their implantables through smartphones, they're going to want to communicate and talk to manufacturers. So make sure that portal is simple and easy to use for a lay person. And then we need to make sure that the portal has been addressed from a cybersecurity perspective in the same way you may protect your internal servers or your internal web servers. 
And then just to finish up, we recommend certain disclosures for, for portals that you'll see in the report just to protect the company as much as possible so that when you receive vulnerability information, you have some legal protections built in. And lastly, disclosure and collaboration. Everyone we interviewed emphasized the importance of collaborating with FDA, particularly early in the process, as well as DHS, ICS cert to the greatest extent possible. And lastly, the security researchers. Your interests may align, they may not, but certainly the initial thought is it's very important to um, treat them with respect, communicate regularly, and be open to an ongoing dialogue with them. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Paul, Luke, and John. We're representatives from Debevoy and Plimpton, and Alferez and Marcel. Luke, if you would stay, and we'll bring our other panelists forward. Uh, we'll go into the next sec section here. As our panelists come forward, I will begin the introductions just to maintain a good flow here. <clears throat> go into the expert panel discussion. First of all, Seth Carmody, FDA. Raise your hand, Seth, so we can all recognize who you are. <clears throat> Greg Garcia, uh, HSCC. We have Zach Rothstein, Advamed. And we have Megan Rossi from uh, Becton. Yes. <laughs> Dana, Megan, Rossi from Becton Dickinson. So with that, uh, we'll go into an expert panel discussion and just have a, an open discussion and then open to Q&A following that. So I'll start with Seth. Uh, Seth, question for you. How does FDA view coordinated vulnerability disclosure and how can the process be used both to communicate and reduce risk? Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so just a few level setting uh, uh, items here. I, I, I thought the information you guys provided was excellent. Uh, the report is very promising. I encourage everybody to take a look when it comes out. Um, first and foremost, you know, the products that medical device manufacturers are making are part of critical infrastructure. It's used to deliver health care, and it should be resilient under duress. Um, and it will be under duress and is under duress. Adversaries exist. Um, that, that is absolutely for sure, and they're not security researchers. Uh, security researchers are not adversaries, but they do bring an adversarial mindset. And engineered products have vulnerabilities in them. So um, I, I, haven't, I think I've written probably less than 100 lines of code, but I'm sure there was a vulnerability in there. In fact, there's vulnerabilities in the compilers that, that uh, compile uh, code. So I think just getting over the sort of uh, I, I've, I've got a problem in my device. It's a vulnerability in my device, and having to take care of that and having mechanisms to take care of that um, is what we try to incentivize and fix in our regulatory policies. So the FDA uh, put out in final uh, 2014 a pre-market cybersecurity guidance, um, management of cybersecurity and medical devices, the post-market guidance in 2016, um, which basically set up a bunch of incentive structures for people to fix things. So we try to cleave in the regulatory policy security and safety. Um, sometimes that's not always clean, but it, it does serve as a useful framework. But in both cases, whether you have vulnerabilities in products that are security issues or you have uh, uh, vulnerabilities in products which end up being safety issues, the entire policy is set up for you to go forward and fix stuff and communicate to your customers uh, what that fix is. So coordinated vulnerability disclosure is a forcing function both internally and provides an avenue for people to communicate stuff to you. Uh, and there are researchers that are interested in finding uh, bugs in your, in, your, uh, in your systems and environments because they care about critical infrastructure and they're bringing these problems to you for you to do something with them. So it's important to have pre po policies, procedures, as the, f the panel preceding me stated, so that you can actually deal with that information. Um, and, and by that, I mean go through your processes and integrate them with your existing processes or stand up new processes so that you can actually then communicate to your customers what you're going to do about it, whether it's a compensating control or maybe it's a software change, um, whatever it is, that you can uh, do that and do that in a timely fashion. Um, so coordinated vulnerability disclosure is not necessarily the end game. It's a forcing functioning inter internally with your organization to get you aligned to deal with security information, which in by and large over the past five years is fairly new, mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that everybody in your organization is aligned and ready to deal with the 
uh, risks of, of security. We also know that it reduces friction externally with security researchers who have uh, many and varied motivations, but in general, uh, lack of communication, a lack of taking uh, them seriously results in bad outcomes. So that's why these coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies are so uh, important because they do serve as a roadmap. They say what the expectations are from their company, uh, and and when they when you bring stuff to uh, when they bring security information to your to your company. Um, the reflexive action uh, that has happened historically, and there's things called the disclosure wars. I wasn't a part of disclosure wars, but it sounds very interesting. Um, is that the reflexive action typically across all critical infrastructure, other uh, commercial vendor space was to slap lawsuits on the security researchers, um, which basically silenced them um, and you didn't have uh, free pen testing. You didn't have uh, somebody helping you out to help fix your product uh, and it was silenced under some legal instruments. So that's where we started uh, in terms of lawsuits. We're moving in towards socialization through coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy, uh, dealing with security issues, and FDA has set forward policies to try and incentivize dealing with the information and fixing it. Thank you, Seth. I think a key point there, medical devices are engineered products. There will be vulnerabilities. <laughs> Zach, as a leader at AdvaMed, how do we best mature cybersecurity practices to meet the needs of small, medium, and large businesses? Sure. So first of all, uh, we did not plan to have the three bald heads in a row. So if the glare is <laughs> a little too strong for you, we can turn the lights down. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because I think what we've seen at Avamed, you know, we represent 300-plus uh, companies as an association, the majority of which are small companies. And we have a specific division set up uh, just for those entities uh, to come together and work with the larger companies on all issues that they face, including cybersecurity. And so we have talked to them at length about setting up training and other types of resources for them to leverage not only the expertise of the larger companies, but all the benefits of their Avamed membership to enhance their cybersecurity activities. So I think if you look at the report uh, that was discussed in the, in the first portion of this panel, um, that will serve as a really instrumental tool in helping these small companies not only establish um, the mechanics of a coordinated vulnerability disclosure portal, but I think internally gaining the buy-in from the C-suite, because that's where I've seen a lot of the issues on the small company side. So having a report that details not only the mechanics, but also the legal implications and some of the regulatory ones, I think really is important. So just a, a kind of final thought here. Um, we talk at Avamed a lot about cybersecurity being a shared responsibility. I think what you're seeing here today as well is that from an industry perspective, we are all working together in sharing our um, efforts in making cybersecurity um, a, an important topic and addressing it together. That's why I think having MDIC um, put together a project like this is, is really critical. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Dana, we'll turn to you next. From a product security and policy perspective at BD, what are your priorities? And maybe you can touch on the software bill of material and how that plays in. Yes, absolutely. So first and foremost, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. One of our priorities at Becton Dickinson in our product security program is transparency and making sure that in everything that we do, whether it is making our product security framework, how we go through the entire life cycle is transparent to the public, to our customers, that we are sharing this information with everybody. Because at the end of the day, whether we're talking about vulnerability disclosure or software bill of materials or any number of, of tactics, at the end of the day, it's all about transparency and making it actionable, making it useful. How do I reach out to my customer and let them know what, what it is that they may, may need to fix, because ultimately, if I'm not letting them know, then they can't fix it, and we're all on the same side. So one of the biggest priorities is absolute transparency and making sure that we're putting out there our policy and procedure, we're putting out our framework, we're letting everybody know all the steps that we take so that we can all work together and build solutions together. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Greg, from a health sector coordinating council perspective, can you give us an overview of the mission and priorities of your group, and what can we learn from other industries? Great. 
Uh, thank you, and, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here um, as well. And congratulations to uh, MDIC and Pamela Goldberg for your uh, fifth anniversary. This is, this is a great turnout, and the, the, the new branding uh, messaging um, is very compelling. I, I think in any organization, if you don't have a good message, um, if you don't have a good image, uh, you know, a nice hairstyle, if you will, um, people aren't <laughs> going to people aren't going to listen. Well, scratch the hairstyle part. But um, anyway, the, the health health care sector coordinating council. Um, a brief overview. The healthcare industry is one of 16 critical industry sectors um, designated under executive order dating back to 1998, and it's been updated a couple of times since then, uh, most recently in 2013. And, and the executive order recognizes that, that it, it identifies these 16 critical sectors like healthcare, financial services, telecommunications, electricity, um, uh, water, transportation, et cetera, and that um, all of these critical sectors are facing day to day threats and vulnerabilities to the delivery of products, assets, services to the general public, and that it's up to the private sector, which owns and operates this critical infrastructure, uh, to identify those threats and vulnerabilities and determine ways that we can mitigate them um, across the sector and between sectors. Um, and the healthcare sector is, again, just one of those 16. Um, we are a sector of multiple subsectors, whether it's medical devices, health IT, hospital systems, pharmaceuticals, um, plans and payers. Um, and, and a sector coordinating council, um, in its responsibility for mitigating threats and vulnerabilities, needs to work across those subsectors because it's an interdependent, um, interconnected ecosystem. And we need to be working with the government in order to do that. And uh, our, our primary um, government partner is, of course, the Department of Health and Human Services and the FDA. Um, and we need to be working in a collaborative public-private partnership, not a regulatory model, not a competitive model, but a public-private partnership that recognizes this shared responsibility that we've all been talking about. Um, and so therefore, we have sort of a quasi-official relationship with the government, but we also have a very clear public responsibility because the public depends upon and demands um, our attention to these issues uh, that can affect our, the nation's economic security, homeland security, public health and safety. And that's why we are all here right now. Um, so getting specific to the issue that we're talking about, um, we have the Healthcare Sector, Sector Coordinating Council has a cybersecurity working group I'm the executive director of that. Um, there are now 100 and almost 200 member organizations from across those uh, healthcare subsectors that I discussed, about 375 private sector representatives. And we're broken out into uh, 13 major task groups that are very task and outcome oriented, deliverable, specific deliverables, get the job done, fold up your tent, and move on to the next challenge. Two of those are, are in nearing completion. Advamed and BD are, are two are leaders of one of these task groups, which is the medical device uh, security joint, joint security plan. And they're looking at a guidance document that, um, uh, that sets forth certain commitments that the medical device community will hold itself accountable for um, to the public and to, to HDOs in terms of designing uh, security into their medical devices, designing, development, production, um, distribution, uh, um, patching, including uh, uh, vulnerability disclosure, um, supported lifetimes issues. And um, concurrently, there is a group um, that is working on the top 10 hospital cybersecurity best practices, which is what are their responsibilities as HTOs? Um, in the gamut of managing network security within a hospital system, but also medical devices, third-party risk management. And so these two groups are um, uh, sort of sequentially going to be rolling out their efforts, um, and they will be cross-referencing each other, because when the medical device community says, and hospital systems need to be aware of how we are managing our, our product lifecycle security, then the hospital systems can, can be looking at the medical device security plan that Advamed, BD, and the others are generating. Um, and, and likewise, uh, the medical device security plan can be looking at hospital best practices 
what are the hospitals going to be expecting from us with, you know, medical, uh, with uh, vulnerability disclosure requirements, with software bill of materials, with that whole list of questions about how a medical device company is managing its own internal security processes and production processes so that they actually have a mutual understanding. So that's what a sector coordinating council is intended to do, which is to try to address those cross-cutting issues uh, where threats and vulnerabilities are affecting us equally, perhaps in different ways, but there is equal impact that requires a joint solution, that requires a shared solution. Um, if you've got a shared challenge, you've got to have a shared responsibility, and it isn't a matter of circular finger pointing. This is an interdependent ecosystem. So any, any of the sector coordinating councils across the spectrum um, recognize that they have differences of opinion within subsectors. Um, and that they need, the sector council is the big table, if you will, the major stakeholders and their representative trade associations to try to work out where we can find those, those uh, common points of, of agreement so that we can actually move forward um, and improve the security and resiliency of our sector and, and of our nation. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Luke, uh, quick question, and then we'll open up to the audience here for other questions. <clears throat> are cybersecurity threats to medical devices increasing or otherwise changing? Well, they're definitely changing, um, Randy. I think, you know, whether you've got a, uh, a device connected to the broader hospital ecosystem, which is a bigger challenge for the reasons mm -hmm. just said by Greg and others, uh, or whether it's an independent, uh, independently functioning uh, device, you know, where perhaps uh, something can be pushed out to it remotely or even it's physically uh, brought in. The risks are complex. We see, as I said earlier, a broader array of threat actors after this information. We see a huge push to get patient data. Um, we used to see years ago when I started prosecuting these cases, people just try to take information like your credit card that they could immediately monetize. Now we see a much more mature criminal and possibly nation state effort to gain information about people's private lives, including medical information and stuff that's not necessarily immediately monetizable. Yes, you could sell it, but there's some longer term goal. So it's a stepping stone to a bigger scheme or bigger effort. Um, so I think the threats are changing and more complex. We need to have greater situational awareness it needs to be an integrated sector-wide and with the government support approach, as my colleagues on the panel have said. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very good. Well, we have a clear panel of experts from industry, government, trade association, legal. Uh, we'll open up the, to the audience for a question or two before we break for lunch. Question here to the middle, if we could bring a microphone. Uh, I'm Victor Gura. I'm, I'm a physician inventor with a checkered past in terms of vul vulnerability of my inventions. I think we are uh, full of holes like Swiss cheese. It starts when I do uh, research in academic institutions where what we're generating, which is or might be generated, is available to other uh, perhaps uh, ill-desiring uh, entities around the globe. Uh, just available. Uh, it starts with the lack of education. I think that a young uh, student that goes into bioengineering should be taught about cybersecurity and what it means. I think you go to, you start college, and that may be a state college or it may be Harvard and MIT. There are no classes to teach about what cybersecurity means and what is, is important. Uh, as a physician doing inventions, I found myself all of a sudden with my computer being penetrated by some foreign entities that had a very uh, big interest in hijacking my technology. It didn't work, but it happened. And that's when I learned the hard way that we're, we're not there. We have uh, no education of the medical community, of the bioengineering community, about what the unmet needs are for cybersecurity. Uh, there's no legislation to push that, uh, and that makes the country vulnerable and the interests of 
those that are busy creating new intellectual property as well. So perhaps this is a time for the panel to indicate what would be the initiatives that should be pursued to address these issues. Okay, Greg, if you could respond. Uh, great, great question, actually. When I mentioned we had 13 task groups within the cybersecurity working group of the uh, Health Sector Council, uh, one of them is workforce development. Um, and what you just said is, is being echoed around um, the council and um, other corners of the medical community, and that is um, there is no cybersecurity curriculum in medical and nursing schools for healthcare practitioners. Of course, there's plenty of computer science and computer engineering and cybersecurity degrees everywhere, but that's for people going into that profession. But what about the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians, the pharmacists, um, who, once they graduate from their healthcare profession in university, um, they step into the job with uh, very rudimentary, if any, knowledge about basic cybersecurity hygiene when they are touching all of that healthcare data, all of that healthcare information technology, and the basic cyber hygiene um, is, is not being uh, observed. And, it, 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 and, it, and it's costly in terms of chief information security officers have to have training budgets, and they've got to take clinicians off uh, duty uh, for an hour or two um, uh, every quarter to train them. Um, and that's downtime, and that's cyber attack time. Um, and so what we're going to be doing as part of the workforce task group is to start socializing this idea. Can we develop some pilot projects into the medical school community um, that, would, that would pilot basic cyber training uh, for medical students and nursing students so that they come onto the job already prepared. And we're, we're, we're just in the opening stages of that, but um, I've been hearing from a lot of uh, young doctors fresh out of uh, uh, medical school who said, no, no such thing. I never had any training like that. And it would, be, it would have been useful. <laughs> so, Zach, further comments? Yeah, if I could just add, so, so part of the question and part of Greg's response was more, I think, from the broader... IT enterprise level. Um, when it comes to securing medical devices specifically and education around that, um, we are aware of a number of our larger companies partnering with universities now um, to develop specific courses around product security, whether it be medical devices or other types of products that are connected devices and part of uh, critical infrastructure. So as Greg said, we're at the early stages, but we are seeing certainly an investment in that type of education at this time. Yeah, also, just quickly, I'd like to add, just from a medical device manufacturer's perspective, product security is so new that even when you say, I'm a product security professional, a lot of times you have to explain what that, mm -hmm. that means. And so one of the things that I think that we've heard echo throughout th this panel is talking about that cross-disciplinary approach one of the things that I like to make sure that I speak about, whether it's within my company or within larger groups of like-minded folks like ourselves, this is a team sport, and I am not just product security. I am a liaison within the product security team. Everybody at my company does product security. It is an inherent part of everything that we do, and part of my mission is to make sure that I am I'm leading that charge. I am providing product security champion programs, training and education, whether it's internal, external, and, and bridging that gap to make sure that we all understand that this is a, a team sport. It's a cross-disciplinary function. It is not just me as product security, but it's me as a facilitator to get the resources to everyone around me that works in this field, because it's, it's part of everything we all do, whether or not we've heard of the term product security before or not. It's just the current state of business now. One last comment. <clears throat> so th a lot of great points in that. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack there, but I'll, I'll start with what we're trying to get done at the FDA, Center for Devices, and get medical device manufacturers to do, and it all starts with design. Um, doctors are an integral part of the relay race, and certainly there's a, a, lot, a lot of education that has to help ha happen there. But doctors also need to be doctors and focus on that. They don't need to be security experts. So I think the 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 easier that we can make everybody's jobs by starting with design, uh, secure by design, 
uh, and then maintaining for security will be in a better place. So I think Dr. Gottlieb pointed to a revision to the pre-market guidance that we're currently working on is going through the review process. We've also socialized that from number, with a number of groups to try to catalyze uh, and accelerate that secure by design mentality. Well, that was a really big question, and that will be the only question uh, before we break for lunch. But <laughs> Luke and Dana, Seth and Zach and, and Greg, uh, that's a tremendous panel of experts. Uh, hopefully you'll stay through lunch and we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much.